All right. Welcome, everybody, once again to the Penn State College of Medicine Navigating Primary Immunodeficiency Community Health Partner Echo Series. We're delighted to bring you this very important series with our partners at the Immune Deficiency Foundation. My name is Melissa, and I'm with the Project Echo team. Before I get to our regular announcements, let me ask my Echo partner to introduce herself. Jessie? Hi, everyone. I'm Jessie. I'm an education program coordinator with Project Echo at Penn State, and I'll be helping out with the attendance today. Thank you very much. All right, let's go ahead and begin with our regular announcements. So we ask that you do not share the Zoom link with anyone. Rather, we would ask that you share the registration link so that they can get all of the resources associated with the series. We do ask that you stay muted unless you are speaking. Closed captioning is enabled if you would like to use it. That would be the CC icon on your Zoom screen. We also ask that if you're able, and I realize not everybody is, but if you can, please turn your video on for the entire session. We love to see your smiling faces. We do ask that you remember that no protected health information is allowed when discussing your experiences with patients or clients. We are recording these sessions and they will all be made available to you as well as all of the materials used in the sessions. You just need to email me to request a recording after the session and you must be a registered participant. We do ask that you please respect the fact that no personal medical advice can be given during the session for you or your patient, student, or client. Our partners at the Immune Deficiency Foundation have extensive and excellent resources and information on their website. So that link will always be included in the follow-up email that I will send you the day after each session. In fact, let me put that link into the chat for you all. And in the spirit of Echo's All Teach, All Learn education model, we will all be on a first name only basis during our session. But most importantly, what that means is that everyone is here to learn from one another and that includes participants and panelists alike. And I'm going to ask you to use the chat for questions and suggestions only at the last resort. With this many people in our group, which is wonderful, the chat can sometimes take over the session and make it difficult to pay attention to both the live discussion and the chat. So if you would just please raise your hand, the raise hand icon or simply unmute, to speak, we would appreciate it. We hope that this will be the best way for everyone to be able to get the most out of the session. If you do need to use the chat, please hold off if you see that there is another comment or question in the chat until we are able to get to that comment or question. And finally, if you're logged on with a phone number only or you have others joining you, please send a direct message to Jesse to let her know for our attendance records. We so appreciate that. So today we're gonna to begin with our flash talk on treatment options, such an important topic. And that will be presented by our guest speaker today, Laura Rowe, who will be introducing herself in just a few seconds. Following our talk, our experiences with some challenges and questions will be shared by one of our panelists, Colleen. I will be facilitating the series, the session, and let's move on now to some introductions of our panelists. And I'm gonna start with Ken. Hello, I'm Ken Bass and I'm in Texas. I have CVID, common variable immunodeficiency. And I also serve with IDF as a Get Connected group leader to uh, be a support to other people with the disease in Texas. Thanks so much for being with us, Ken. Diana? Hello, everyone. My name is Diana, and I am the mother of a child with PI. Thank you very much. Megan? Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Messick, and I'm the Director of Education at the Immune Deficiency Foundation, and I'm so grateful to be with you all today. Thank you so much. Colleen? Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I am uh, Colleen Brock, the Manager of Medical Programs at the Immune Deficiency Foundation. I have two young adult children with PI who were diagnosed when they were much younger. And I also was diagnosed with the same CVID about nine years ago. And I am a registered nurse. So I come at this from multiple avenues. <laughs> you do. Thank you so much, Colleen. 
And our guest speaker today, Laura, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Uh, hi, my name is Laura and I am a nurse um, from Omaha, Nebraska. I work in private practice, allergy, asthma, and immunology associates. Um, I am also a patient as well. Um, I have CVID and I am also a member of the Immune Deficiency Foundation Nurse Advisory Committee. So really excited to be here with all of you today. Thank you so much. And thank you for this talk you've created for us. So I'm going to hand things over to you. Laura will be sharing her screen for our talk whenever you're ready. Go ahead, Laura. All right. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Good deal. Got the hard part over. Got to share the screen here. Okay, so yes, happy to be here to talk to you guys about treatment options. What is right for me? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start, excuse me here. I'm going to go ahead and I am going to hide my, there we go, the video is over there. Okay, so let's start with immune globulin replacement therapy. So this is first line treatment for patients that have an antibody deficiency. So these are the patients that have CVID, specific antibody deficiency patients, you know, maybe an XLA patient as well. So uh, we are providing the immune globulin, which is that passive immunity to protect the patient from infection. So the goal of immune globulin therapy is obviously to protect from those infections, you know, providing the immune globulin, which has that opsonizing and neutralizing antibodies to protect patients from bacteria and viruses. So, and to improve quality of life for patients. So for replacement therapy, um, we can only replace the IgG. So this comes from our wonderful plasma donors. So there are just very trace amounts of the IgA and the IgM. And this is, is lifelong, you know, it's called replacement therapy. So it's needed in regular intervals. And, you know, one thing that I always wanna mention is um, these products, you know, that patients receive really are not interchangeable and there are no generic drugs for patients. So patients have options now more than ever. So it's important to understand the different routes of administration, IVIG and sub Q whether you're the patient, the caregiver, the nurse, the pharmacist, I can help you better understand the patient experience, help determine maybe which type of treatment would best fit a patient's lifestyle. And then also, you know, for healthcare providers to make any easy, you know, infusion changes if patients are not tolerating therapy. So let's talk a little bit about IVIG. Uh, venous access is required. You see the picture right there of an IV. So that nurse administers the immune globulin to the patient, stays with the patient. And this is every three to four weeks. Larger volumes, the concentration for the IVIG products are 10% and 5% products. So we are going right into that circulatory system. So we're given that larger amount, you know, right into that vein. So you do have kind of a higher peak and a lower trough level. Systemic adverse reactions can be more frequent. Uh, these can often be alleviated by reducing the rate, oral hydration, and then maybe some pre-medications. So site of care, home infusion, provider's office, patients have options, outpatient infusion center, or even an outpatient hospital as well. So a little bit about sub-Q, subcutaneous immune globulin. So this is another route for patients. So this is administered into the sub-Q tissue. So areas on the body where we have the most sub-Q tissue. So abdomen, thighs, the lateral hip, you know, muffin top area. And this is given in smaller volumes. Um, and we have steady state IgG levels because this is given with a 20% or a 10% product and it can be given daily, weekly, even every two weeks. And because it is administered into the sub-Q tissues, we do have less systemic adverse reactions. It reaches the bloodstream, you know, indirectly, you know, through that lymphatic system. So it takes a couple of days to fully absorb that. So pre-medications are usually not needed because there's less adverse reactions, but as you would expect, because it is a sub-Q product, 
uh, there is that potential for some local infusion site reactions. So, and this is usually self-administered or caregiver administered. I have a lot of patients that have a spouse or an adult child that helps with the infusion. Um, again, daily, weekly, or every two weeks. And the site of care is usually a home infusion, usually after you know several teaching visits, you know, the nurse can go out and train the patient until they're comfortable and confident. And then another route is called facilitated subcutaneous amine globulin. So this is either self or nurse administered into the subcut tissues, abdomen and the thighs. And this is given every three to four weeks. So after this initial ramp up schedule. So this is larger volume. So this is with an IG 10% product. And you're facilitating this first with this hyaluronidase enzyme, which increases that absorption of the Ig, so you can give it in, in larger volume. So it's an every three to four week. So, um, there's more potential for local infusion site reactions, less systemic adverse reactions, and site of care, you know, self-administered or, or nurse administered can be done definitely in the home. And then depending on insurance, outpatient infusion center hospital as well. So patients do have some options there. So this is a real nice chart that the Immune Deficiency Foundation had put out. So it really kind of describes the differences. I won't read all of these in the interest of time, but you know, it really says like the who, when, how long, what are the side effects of the different routes of administration? And you know, one thing that I get a lot for patients, maybe when you're first starting out on therapy, you're trying to determine what's the best fit for me, is you know, patients ask me, you know, if I pick this option, do I have to stay on this? And absolutely not. So you definitely have options. You can switch. And, you know, we do have, we're unfortunately in the hands of insurance a lot, but clinicians can really try to advocate, you know, for the, for the patient, you know, with the payer and, you know, look at other options, you know, insurance may dictate product or site of care, but, you know, healthcare professionals can really try to push back and advocate for patients. So, how to determine that right treatment option. Both IVIG and sub-Q are clinically effective. You know, they're both giving those IgG antibodies to protect the patient. So there's advantages, disadvantages to both. You know, when a patient is, you know, first starting out on therapy, there are many, many, many different factors to consider. You know, what's the patient's diagnosis? Do they just have, you know, the CVID, the infectious phenotype, or do they have a lot of other comorbidities? Do they have a lot of, uh, you know, autoimmune disease going on as well? What is, you know, what is their medical history? You know, is it an older patient? You know, is it a very young patient? Is it somebody that has a lot of heart disease, you know, kidney disease? So these are all factors that really need to be discussed before deciding on that treatment. And it definitely needs to be that shared decision-making. You know, we, we talk about this a lot between the patient and the provider. And the provider really does educate the, the patient on the different treatment options but patients really need to empower themselves and take that active role and really kind of do their own homework and find out, you know, more about the different options, more about the different products and the different routes. So, you know, the hurdles of treatment, you know, IG is so expensive, you know, what resources are available. So, you know, when I have conversations with my patients all the time, you know, it's with, you know, with CVID or primary immune deficiency, you know, it's not just the physical disease of a primary immune deficiency. It's everything that goes along with that, you know, the financial aspects, you know, that burden of disease, you know, the emotional, you know, issues that patients can have and some barriers. So, you know, the good news is those with commercial insurance, there's um, IG copay cards, which are wonderful patients do need to know the name of their product that they're on. A lot of them just say I'm on infusions, you know, so they really need to know which product they're on so that they can take advantage of the copay card. So very, very important. There are some free products, um, free trials um, that usually offer three to four weeks of free drug and supplies and then the nursing visit. So this is a great option for patients that are maybe wanting to try sub-Q, maybe they're on IVIG, they're thinking about sub-Q. So this is wonderful for patients. It doesn't go through insurance, just gives them that, you know, four week free trial. And then specialty pharmacies really can offer financial assistance. I have a lot of Medicare age patients um, in our practice. So, and a lot of them have, you know, really high out-of-pocket costs. So I do encourage patients 
to reach out to their specialty pharmacy. They do have to ask for this, but they have to ask if they need help with their out-of-pocket costs and they can fill out some financial assistance paperwork. And then there's wonderful nonprofit organizations such as the assistance funds that can really help patients to, um, you know, with any out-of-pocket costs. So I encourage all patients really to enroll in all the programs that their manufacturing product offers. So there's things called assurance programs that keep track of their doses in the event they were to lose a lapse of insurance coverage. I use this a lot, especially during, you know, the, the COVID pandemic. So very, very important. And then, you know, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, patient advocacy, you know, patients and caregivers, you know, again, should encourage that open communication, you know, you know, it's going to change over time. IG is usually, you know, um, lifelong. So if you have a patient maybe first starting out on therapy as a child, moving on to adolescence, adult, you know, work, family life, you know, and then the elderly population, you know, the goals of therapy are going to change, you know, their life is going to change. So, you know, so can their treatment plan. So patients, you know, are, are dynamic and what's best for them now may not be ideal in a few years. So, you know, nurses really play a big role, a key role, you know, by helping improve the quality of life. You know, we do encourage patients to really speak up promptly. You know, if they don't want to bring it up to the doctor, bring it up to the nurse and the nurses can help, you know, go to the prescriber with any issues that can impact quality of life for patients. So, you know, if they're not tolerating something or something isn't right, maybe they're non-compliant now you know, there's usually something that we can do to help improve those outcomes. So this is like kind of a constant, we're evaluating this, you know, again, not just when they're first starting out, but maybe you've got them on the phone, you're talking about something else, or they're coming into the office every every six months. So, you know, we can definitely change the, the route of administration, change the product if they do have any un unwanted side effects. So we can we can do that. And then this is something great. So this G code that came out, this home infusion therapy in, in 2021 for Medicare B patients. So this code can be used to get coverage for the nurse to go out and administer patients, you know, sub Q infusion if they have any hand dexterity issues. So, so this is wonderful. I use this a lot for my patients, you know, if, um, if, if they can't administer their sub Q infusion on their own. So and then the Immune Deficiency Foundation is, you know, just working, you know, tirelessly on, on all of these projects here. The IVIG demonstration project is going to be permanent starting in January, which is great. And then the terrible skilled nursing facility issue, which basically, you know, Medicare, if you have a patient that needs to go into a rehab, uh, they won't take the patient's and or they take them and they cannot get their immune globulin while they're in a skilled nursing facility. So so this is very, very unfortunate. And I have a very high Medicare age population. So this happens a lot. So both the Immune Deficiency Foundation is really working on this. And then the dreaded copay accumulators, again, they're also working on federal bill and, and state bills to ban to ban this action. So some key takeaways, you know, um, you know, IG is, is life-saving, you know, and it is lifelong, you know, there are, there are many options available. There's usually something that we can do. Easy modifications can be made, you know, to change, you know, patient's treatment plans. So it really depends on expert clinical knowledge and then, you know, just the collaboration, collaboration with the healthcare team, you know, you've got the nurse and then you've got the patient and the provider and then the specialty pharmacy all working with the, you know, basically, you know, with the patient to figure out what is going to work for them. You know, each patient is unique and so is their IG treatment plan. So and when, when patients are part of that decision making, they are likely to be more compliant and have a positive outcome. So encourage, you know, and support advocacy. Again, you know, we tell patients knowledge is power, be your own advocate, really speak up, call your nurse or provider with any issues. There's usually something that we can do by offering, you know, best practices, training techniques to really try to improve, you know, their infusion for patients with PI. So, and just some references and resources, again, the Immune Deficiency Foundation, the Jeffrey Modell Foundation, uh, Patient and Family ha Handbook by the Immune Deficiency Foundation, and then there's um, going to be a skilled nursing facility uh, handout that uh, we can attach for you as well. I again encourage my patients to, you know, go to their IG manufacturer. There's advocacy programs and speak to a patient that has PI or a caregiver. And then, 
Definitely, it's an expensive drug, so there's financial assistance out there through the manufacturers. All right. So that was very fast and quick. I talked kind of fast, so. <laughs> Thank you so um, much, Sarah. That was wonderful. Uh, I have to fix a mistake I made. I apologize. I missed one of our panelists. Dr. Paula Hanau is also with us here from Penn State Health. She's an allergist immunologist. Um, so does anybody have any questions for Laura? You did a great job covering it, Laura. See, all wonderful questions. Okay, if nobody has any questions for Laura, who has a question for you? Go ahead, Colleen. Melissa, I just want to add a couple things. Um, it, my apologies, there is a uh, typo in the chart, and we will get it corrected, where uh, the facilitated subcutaneous infusions are approved for H2 and up. Mm. Yes. So we will we will get that Great fixed. Test. Um I think bef well uh, I'll wait. We'll do the experience first. So I, I have something that I think would be great for Laura to talk about, but let's do the experience first so we make sure we get into that. But I wanted to make sure that so it's not all children, it's children two and up for the facilitated. Perfect. Thank you. We'll get that corrected before we send it out to everyone. Yes. So let me share my screen then. If you think of a question for Laura, you can always ask at any time, but we do have an experience to share to get our discussion started. So Colleen- I think like Debbie had an experience or had a hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I didn't want to interrupt your flow. You guys are- No, go ahead. Friend. My, you guys are doing amazing. Um, my name is Debbie. I'm from New Jersey. I am a, a registered nurse. I am disabled due to multiple medical conditions. Um, I was just recently approved for Zembify um, sub-Q infusions at home. Due to, I have common variable immune deficiency and hypogamma globulinemia. Um, just wondering if anybody has any experiences with that one because I also have mast cell disease, so I can't have anything with corn and sugar. So that would that's pretty much the only product that um just wondering that I that they think will not cause me anaphylaxis. So I was just wondering if anybody has experience with that one. I have quite a few patients that are that are on Zembify and and they tolerate tolerate it well. Um, I I don't have a whole lot of experience with patients having any like allergies like you have. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's definitely a good point and something to to definitely consider. Um, I'm not off the top of my head. I can't think of the the is it glycine that might be the stabilizer for Zembify? Um, I think. Um, I. I don't better. have the list of ingredients and stuff, but yeah, I guess in all the other products, mm -hmm. there is glucose or corns in it. So okay. my allergist and I had to do a very thorough deep dive. <laughs> so um, I was just curious because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. nerve wracking to start something knowing you go into anaphylaxis over everything, you know, and I'm so I just wanted some information about that. But otherwise, thank you. And you guys are amazing. I had the same thing with corn. Um, and it was at the time when I was in the hospital getting infusions. Ooh. And all of a sudden, they changed up what they were giving me one day. And it was Octagam. And so, you know, I had my computer started pulling it up. And it uses the corn uh, syrup for the sugar. and so oh before they hooked me up I said you need to ask if we're really supposed to use this <laughs> um, they had my medical history but I, I hear what you're saying and I think it adds to what Laura was saying know the product that you've got and and not just the name of it but you know look into you know what is it that is the sugar what's the osmolality things like that because the osmolality is how thick it's going to be. <laughs> and you, mm -hmm. you want to know that too, you know, so uh, okay. know your product. I liked what you said there, Laura. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks, Debbie, for bringing that up. Appreciate that. Okay, we'll move on then to our experience. Colleen, gonna give us the details. All right. So today we have a 17 year old high school student with CVID. She was diagnosed at the age of eight and has been on IVIG every three weeks since that time. She receives her infusions at home, is very comfortable, and everything has been going smooth. She's had the same nurse for 10 years and absolutely loves her. She has no side effects. She takes no pre or post meds, and she currently gets 40 grams IV every three weeks. I did add uh, that she's a very difficult stick which is why she loves her nurse so much because her nurse can stick her. And so she gets very nervous with new nurses. So the conversation was started somewhat because of that anxiety question concern with being stuck. So she's going away next year to college. She will be three hours from home. And uh, she started thinking about, okay, so my nurse isn't coming and I can't count on being able to go home every time I need it. So would switching to sub Q be a good option? And if I'm thinking about doing that, you know, it's, it's early fall, she's got time, but when does she switch? And what is that process? So, and and the other question was, how well is sub Q going to fit into college life? Is it is it better than IV, or is doing IV better than sub Q for those who are in college? Slightly anxious. Uh, go back one more time. Again, along with the anxiety of being stuck and being a difficult stock she's a little bit nervous about sticking herself. She knows it's not like starting an IV and it's not where she has to, to be a nurse to do it. But she has seen pictures on Facebook and she's seen reactions that people have. So she's she brought a lot of concerns about, do I really want to do this? And so it, it it was a conversation of, again, sort of what Laura had talked about. It's the medical component, but it's also the lifestyle component. And her mother is extremely worried that if she goes to school, doesn't work, or she gets busy, will she forget? And then will she get sick? And it kind of goes from there. So next, please. So the questions are, what is the best way to handle the changing of the method? And when should she start that change? How long ahead of August should she start to do that? What is involved with getting her supplies and her medicine at school? Because now she would be responsible for making sure that she has everything on hand, where for years, it's always been somebody else who's taking care of it. Should she expect to have side effects or issues with sub Q? She knows that obviously doing the IV, she's never had any issues. Could she now, could something change because it's not going to be the exact same thing that she's getting? And what if it doesn't work? How does she manage being away and going back to IV and setting all that back up. Is that something that is going to cause her more stress and anxiety? Uh, so any tips and tricks for handling the anxiety of changing the methods and um, information on what answers we can give the mom and this, this teenager going forward. Okay, thank you for presenting that. It's a very complicated experience. I, I'm sure very difficult for someone in that position. So we'll turn to participants first, as we do with Echo. And I'll ask you all if you have any questions for Colleen about this person, anything you'd like to know. 
and also what some suggestions you might have for any of these questions. I'll leave them up for a little bit so you can take a look. Where would you start? Go ahead, Janie. Hi, um, I'm Janie Krieger. I'm a, a retired pediatrician um, and I have uh, not seasonal defective disorder. Anyway, I have specific antibody deficiency, but I just found out about that. But anyway, um, so I think this gal needs a touch base person at her new school, whether she does it IV or sub Q she needs to have a go-to person. Um, so she, I would, I would encourage her to, um, if she can, before she gets to campus to have a, at least a Zoom meeting with student health and identify a nurse or a, some provider that can help her. Um, that, yeah, that would be my suggestion. And then start early in the summer to start transitioning over. Um, and she may, she may have good luck um, initially at school if she wants to do sub Q, she may have good luck actually going to the clinic and then having somebody kind of supervise her doing it to herself and then kind of wean over with the understanding that at any moment she can get their support. That's a great suggestion. Thank you for that. Anyone else? I still have the questions up there. If you want to address any of those questions or ask some questions of your own, go ahead, Megan. One of the things that in any type of transition, I think it's important to rely on the community that she is a part of. There are many others who have gone before this process before her. And that's where community support is really important. Talking to peers, both the mom and the patient to understand like what it's, how did you make that transition to college from, did you stay on IVIG? Maybe in fact there, you know, nursing services could be provided in the dorm. Uh, with even though there's the lovely nurse who is an expert stick for her, you know, could that transition be possible? What was it like to transition to sub Q? I think hearing hearing from peers is very very valuable, especially in this age group. And she's at a point where she's going to be making her own decisions away from school, and it helps to have peers that are supporting her in her community um, as she thinks about all these transitions. And I would begin having these discussions as early as possible because there's a lot of activity going on in that transition to college. And just waiting that few months before college might be a very condensed period of time. That's a good point. Busy, busy time in the life of a teenager moving to college. Excellent points. Thank you so much. What do some others think? Yeah, I think I'm I'm agree with the uh, with Megan about it because I have um you know my my son actually just started um college and uh, definitely is a really stressful time uh, since they're like in senior. You know, they're in in, uh, in high school. It's a stressful time, and uh, in this case, is that uh, it's gonna be more stressful for her because she not only has to think about college life, she needs to think about how is her treatments are gonna be. So I think that uh, at this point, she really needs to connect with um with uh, um uh, with the, with the, uh, with the, her provider and have the, the the training, the proper training, all the information that she will need for, for her to make a decision. Because in that period of time, she will decide it is going to something that she's going to be, she's going to, is, is she's going to be willing to do it or not? Is she's going to be a good fit or not? So it's, I think that with time, she will decide what is going to be better for her. Yeah. Excellent points. Yeah. So it's good. To, I remember Laura saying to her during her talk that we become a good advocate. And that's tough 
for that age group, but might be something at that point that she needs to really do. John, go ahead. Well, I would just want to add that uh, first, agreeing with everything that has been said, and by all means, get someone on campus, uh, and by all means, get started now, but don't try to decide everything at once. I think investigating this for a while is a good rehearsal at this age for not only the decision about college, but this is a decision that comes up throughout a person's life with CVID who may find one method works better or works better for their lifestyle or is more effective medically. There's always so many factors. And so this is a chance now for her to rehearse this. She needs to know if there's some dependable people at the campus. Does she have a campus that has a, a very uh, active advocating health service or one that's basically only on paper? Um, and there's going to be the medical questions of is, is this with this going so well, why would you stop something medically that's going so well without problems and introduce a ver medical variable at the very time that everything else in her life is changing. Um, I'd leave it to the medical people to talk about that side, but I certainly think about let's don't put everything on her to change at the same time and uh, tr try to manage how the change occurs. Uh, I've, I've been that age a long time ago. I don't think I've ever grown out of a little bit of it, which is I want to get everything done right now and know for certain. And um, both for this decision and the rest of her life, she's going to need to get a little more comfortable with more research and more wondering and, and trusting the process and reaching out to that community. And uh, there are lots of people through uh, IDF who have been through this process. So there are lots of people to ask, but just realizing that her answer ultimately will have to be her answer for the medical and uh, uh, where she lands in college and for you know quality of life issues that are more personal to her. Thank you, John. Excellent, excellent points. I was thinking about parents too. That's a tough age for parents and for for their young adults moving on. And how anybody has suggestions for parents as caregivers? How you allow them, especially when they have such a serious medical condition, to reach out to ask? How do you support them in doing that? I will just say unrelated to this specific case, but from nearly everybody on this call, uh, this is a good reminder that you should start this kind of planning when your kid is six years old, because uh, helping to train them in to be their own care advocates and have these conversations, you know, with school, with employers, with, you know, with new people in their life, um, it really starts as soon as they start talking. Good point. Yeah, I see a lot of nods, John. People agreeing. Uh, we're not finished with participants, but I do want to just pull our panelists in for a second about uh, some advice from the medical folks that we have. What questions would this young person need to ask? What would you advise them about connecting to a health center? I, I'm sure health centers are different depending on where you go to college. Any thoughts from some of our medical folks at the foundation or Dr. Hanau, Paula? <laughs> so this is, this is, I agree, um, I think with Ken completely in, in this, in terms of trying to do one step at a time, because it can be totally overwhelming um, to do too many changes at once. Um, that being said, I think um, discussing with them the benefits of of sub Q that you know ex 
having an extensive discussion with someone about um the 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 benefits that the change may be a good change and and I think Diana might have spoken to us about sub Q a little bit uh, on an earlier chat too um that can help um handle a little bit of the anxiety um that's related to to sub Q um and we do have such great success with uh sub Q um and specifically in this patient population it's it's such a great option uh to be able to have a sense of empowerment to be able to do something yourself as opposed to relying on someone else um that um does a lot to, I think, self-esteem, um, graded autonomy, and things of that nature. So over time, I think if we do things slowly, it can be really powerful um, and um, can help uh, along the lines with a lot of the emotional issues tied to it. Thank you. Go ahead, Janie. So I think one of the important things is um, before she goes to college to stay three hours away. Both she and her mom need the same phone number for a healthcare provider um, and depending on the rules of confidentiality, but mom is gonna get a call that her daughter is either not feeling well or she's having trouble with something about her IVIG or her sub Q. And she needs to be able to tell her daughter, call this person. And, and they need to have a plan in place for when that call happens. And they don't need to scramble at that time to find a website or a person or something. Mom needs to know, call Miss Sally or, you know, and, and she needs to know that the daughter needs to give permission ahead of time that Miss Sally can talk to her mom. Um, that will alleviate a lot of problems. For sure. Yeah, that planning ahead, so important. Anybody else with questions or suggestions or answers to any of the questions that we have here? What's involved with getting her supplies and meds at school? I have no idea. Any thoughts on that? Go ahead, Megan. I have an experience. A friend of mine actually has to deliver um, her son's supplies because the mail service at the dorm is so unreliable, but they, they're getting, they're learning some workarounds after a year, but it is something that if the supplies are shipped directly to the student, you need to have a really good plan. Maybe they need to be shipped to a specific, find a friend on campus, like a faculty member or staff member, or we're, you have to figure this out because mail services in college are not all the same. Um, you know, it's a lot different. So you've got to figure that out um, early and off and, and make sure it's working. Good tip, that planning ahead. There's a lot more to consider than when you're, you know, when your parents are taking care of it. So now it's all on you. Go ahead, Colleen, and then Laurel. I, I was just going to say, <laughs> when Emily was in school, she she got <laughs> me, but I would also recommend talking to, if you're doing IV, the home health agency or whoever is in charge of mailing the supplies. I love Megan's plan. I wish I had thought of that because I remember the day that Em called and said, mom, so they wanted to just set it outside my dorm. And I told them, no. <laughs> and then they said, well, maybe somebody will let me in and I'll just put it outside your room. And she's like, uh, no. And then she said, the girl was, she said, but I don't know that they'll know where to deliver the mail. She said, Mom, this is a college campus. I think UPS has been here more than once. I think they know where to go. <laughs> so Emily ended up having to sort of educate them. But I really like Megan's idea. Maybe instead of the mailroom, which a college campus, especially depending upon the size, has to be chaos anyway, is there a 
a way to have it mailed even directly to the school nurse. And then she just pick it up from the nurse kind of thing. I, I never thought of that. Emily eventually worked it out and, and she would get it, but it was just, I remember that phone call because it was just kind of funny. They just wanted to set it outside the dorm room, I get or the dorm and hope nobody took it. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my goodness. So it's good to share experiences for sure, because that's, I wouldn't have thought of that either. Go ahead, Laurel. Did you want to ask a question or make a, a suggestion? Yeah. Good morning. Um, the, the one thing I want to say is I think that it's great for sub Q at college because for, for the primary reason is it does give you that steady state of IG, which doesn't allow the fluctuations of the ebb and flow of the trough, which helps contain um, infections. I had some uh, brothers that were doing it at the University of Florida and it, the, the amount of time that was taken out of their day to set the schedule, to check into the health center, et cetera. And then they had to order the med and it was it was really a long process. So it does allow them to acclimate into a more, some, some normalcy there. The, the two things that I think are important to take into consideration this is you can have the delivery that has a, a you have to sign for it so that you can, you know, find have if it's delivered to the dorm, you can say the front door, et cetera, and then you would have to sign for it. It can be delivered to the health center itself. Um, one of the, because it then allows the the student to be able to accommodate their own schedule as well, which then leads into a problem or a concern perhaps of of compliance, um, meaning to make sure that the student is mature enough to understand the outcome if they miss or skip their infusions, um, just to maintain some sort of regularity of their infusion cycle, which means they could even switch to every two weeks because that could be easier for their for their schedule, but to make sure that they do it um, completely, maintain, I mean, completely maintain um, a good cycle with their infusions there. Yeah, great tip there, the having to sign for it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm going to open it up now to our panelists. Some thoughts from you all. Participants, you're welcome to also chime in, but let's see what, what our panelists' thoughts are on this experience. I would uh, answer the, the question of can you switch back and forth? Because I tried um, sub Q for a while because I had trips coming up and things like that and thought there's going to be a more convenience for it. Um, it didn't work out for me. And so I ended up switching back and I would say it was harder to switch to sub Q than from sub Q back to IVIG because sub Q gives you the product that you need, you know, for the next weeks and you can be arranging, you know, how and when you're going to finally get back on IV, but definitely can be done where you go back and forth and um, you're not, you're not stuck with something I think would be the, the important thing to tell that person that they have the ability to, to fluctuate. And I just want to say yes, yes, yes to that. Don't wait. To, if you're going to you know think of trying it, go ahead and do it now and get used to it before you go to school. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. That's, I, I agree with you completely. The um, flexibility of going back and forth. I certainly have had um a lot of patients do this um in 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 my experience like all, most of my patients tolerate sub q really well however there are certain patients that do much better with with iv and and actually go back and forth because of different circumstances so maybe they'll um be sub q for a while and then want to try iv and then they because of ease in terms of getting it at a center. Some people just do better um, just having it taken care of. Uh, I have several patients who are moms and they're like, I just don't want my children to see me uh, doing you. this. Mm -hmm. And so I just rather do it at a, an infusion center. Um, and that works really well. And then at times we have issues with IV access. So maybe that's another time to consider switching back to sub Q. So going back and forth is absolutely very, very reasonable. Um, I do say with, I've had a lot of issues myself with patients that are very, very thin um, and that have like 
um, no, no fat, um, with being able to tolerate sub Q. So in those patient populations, even from the offhand, I say, Ooh, you really have like no fat. Sometimes it might, some of my patients have struggled with, with sub Q in those cases. And we just kind of do some anticipatory guidance in that setting. Yeah. Doesn't mean that they can't try sub Q, but, um, it's just something that they might struggle a little bit more. Thanks, Paula. Go ahead, Megan. Yeah, something I just wanted to hit on that I think many of you have said quite beautifully throughout the presentation is just the theme of when we're supporting someone who has a PI of knowing that we don't ourselves have to be the expert if we can instead just promote a space where we're allowing them to be the experts, that we're creating a space that is supporting of them making a decision that's not instant, but we're asking them questions of, are, are you allowing yourself the time to make the best decision? How can I help create that space? How, how can I create that environment with you? So acknowledging that we don't always have to be the person that knows, but we could always be the person that provides that space and environment for our community. Beautifully put, Megan, thank you. I might add, um, just echoing off what uh, John said earlier about, I obviously, my son is 11, and so we're not close to college here yet, but um, starting those conversations, I think, you know, you said at six years old, but um, my son is part of what he's been going through. I, you know, we've been homeschooling for a few years now. And one of his projects last year was to make a PowerPoint on um, his PI and how it affects them and how it's treated. And we did this as a primary to um, some family members that didn't quite understand it, but coming from his own words is, you know, starting to advocate for himself. Um, so I really like what you said about that, John. You know, those conversations are starting early and not just at the age of 17. And that's what we are doing, hopefully, to prepare him for his future when mom doesn't, you know, give his sub cue anymore. Um, and all that, you know, accumulated to having a positive mindset um, in this uh instead of all the worry and the nervousness about going off to college, um, embracing that excitement and getting to go off to college, not, um, you know, and that I think is part of the mom's job and will be my job is to not be so um, worry, worrisome and nervous. You, you're, those feelings are obviously very, very valid, but um, being excited and, um, not bringing down this next chapter with this is my disease. It is you get to go to college or, you know, you're starting a new chapter in your life. You're taking over your medical um, situation and being more positive about it. Will, will I be there for hiccups? Absolutely. Um, will I step in with insurance if I need to? Of course. <laughs> However, that mindset of, oh, woe is me, I have to do this at college, um, is a back burner. I guess in my opinion, I'm not there yet, and I'm a novice in the parenting world of um, this, but I'd like to say that, that that mindset that being more positive and um, excited can very much outweigh the worrisome and this doesn't have to be all that it's about um it's a very small part of you know that chapter of your life yeah that's a great point diana it seems like that planning ahead that everyone was talking about would really be helpful absolutely yeah <laughs> do any other participants have questions or panelists suggestions for us I just want to remind you, I see Colleen's writing all of these down. We're going to send you all these recommendations once they're vetted. We'll send those out tomorrow. There have been some excellent ones. The one thing I would like Laura to jump in real quick on is the meds, pre and post meds, IV versus sub-Q. 
Sure. Yes. You know, um, cause I would think that would change. I mean, she doesn't have anything, but could it change? What, what sure. should she expect? Sure. Yeah. I mean, most of the time for sub Q pre-meds are not needed, you know, and, and especially someone who um, isn't using any pre-meds for IVIG. So I would not anticipate needing any pre-meds at all, at all for, for sub Q as well. So, um, but you know, I think um, you guys, all of your information was so great, you know, every bit of it. I think the other thing is, you know, the only other couple of things I would add would be maybe do like starting early, like maybe starting now, <laughs> you know, that way you've got nine months or however many months um, and then doing like a, maybe a free trial, maybe doing that free trial of, you know, of the sub Q product. You'd have got that free four weeks right there. doesn't go through insurance. I think that's a great option. And then, um, you know, working very closely, you know, with, with a specialty pharmacy and then really, you know, teaching about the sub Q route versus IV. So, you know, explaining, you know, this is your number of grams. I can't remember how many grams it was, you know, for IVIG, but this is about what you're going to be on maybe eight or 10 grams a week, you know, and this is going to go into your, under your skin. So really educating on, on, you know, local infusion site reactions and then, and then, you know, working closely with the specialty pharmacy and, you know, if the, if it's not working out, you got to give it the good old college try though. You got to try 12 weeks, you know, so starting now would be good. And then, you know, you can switch back, especially if you've got a specialty pharmacy involved, it's really going to be a piece of cake switch into IVIG. And then one last thing, um, I do have a, a couple of, of patients and they're getting IVIG while in college. And instead of doing it in, in the dorm room, you know, um, it, this is a little smaller college that, you know, specialty pharmacies worked out with them where they can in, do the IVIG infusion in a separate room. So sometimes that's really nice too. So, you know, working closely with student health and disability office as well to try to use those resources. Thank you. Shannon, go ahead. Okay, so real quick, um, I actually was an advocate in the specialty pharmacy world for years. The biggest thing I would say is to have your kids, um, if you are getting their infusion shipped to your home, practice ordering um, their drugs and supplies, because a lot of what would happen is I would just speak to mom or dad. Um, the kid would turn 18. The kids wanted nothing to do with it still. Um, if they weren't going to college, they would sign a form and they didn't really want to have to think about it. Um, and then college comes and I would try to coordinate. I had one, for instance, where the mom still had to coordinate with me and then relay it to the son because he didn't want to talk to me. So starting those conversations early, have them be on speakerphone when you are ordering, um, have them ask questions, that kind of thing. I think that's super important. Excellent. Excellent point. Oh, those kids. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. Janny, did I miss you? Did you want to say something? No? Okay. Anybody else? We have just in, like two minutes. Any other questions or suggestions we didn't get to that you want to bring up? Panelists or participants? I'm just going to add that even though this is an experience of a teenager, I think everything that everybody has contributed in this conversation applies to anybody of any age. Yeah, excellent point. Yeah, Absolutely. great conversation. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, everybody, for all your wonderful ideas and thoughts. Uh, thank you very much, Laura, for your talk. Again, I will send that out to everybody. Thank you, Colleen, for sharing that experience. Uh, you will all receive a session evaluation. We ask that you just take a few minutes to complete that. Please keep in mind the link does expire in seven days. Our next session will be November 13th, and we'll talk about transitioning care. So from child, adolescent, to adult, to Medicare, the whole range. And we hope to see you all back then. Thank you so much, everybody, for your wonderful participation today. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.